Cool. Hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season. Um, I'm your host, Lisa, and I'm here today with my very esteemed guest, uh, Venkat. Hey, Lisa. Pleasure to be here. I'm Venkat, and I'm here with my guest, Lisa. <laughs> hey, Venkat, did you, do you have a snack that you're eating today? Yeah. So my first snack was kind of lame. It's just a cup of tea for tea. <laughs> But then I decided to augment it with a bunch of cherry tomatoes. So I have like three colored tomatoes. Wow, those are pretty. That's a, a good collection of tomatoes. Um, tomatoes and tea. Tea and tomatoes. Um, What's I'm your snack? Eating, I've got Triscuits. Okay. Um, which I saw a really fun Twitter post about a few weeks ago, maybe months ago at this point, um, where Triscuit got its name from. Um, I'll have to link it when we're done but they used to be called electricity biscuits yes i think i saw that a few weeks ago as well i might even have tweeted it yeah that's that's really hilarious um like they were baked in an electric oven or something when electric ovens were new right yeah that's yeah, awesome. it was, yeah it was a totally new thing and it's like they're so they were electricity biscuits which i think they've lost most of the electric motif on their packaging these days but um yeah, I'll see if I can find that Twitter thread to link to because it's kind of fun. Cool, great. So I guess I obviously we're on the letter T today since we both have tea snacks. Um, uh, let's see. Our first topic on the list is oh boy, this is a big one. We should start with it though. Yeah, it's a uh, tealism. All right, tealism. All right, can we do tealism in ten minutes? We're trying to do the ten minutes per topic, right? So yeah, let's uh, yeah, dispose of Peter Teal in ten minutes. Okay. What do you have to say about Peter Thiel? <laughs> I was actually just reading the link you put in our uh, document, your essay from November 2019, uh, oh, yeah. where you quote um, his, uh, I think he said something like uh, libertarianism is not compatible with um, women and a welfare state or something. And I think you had an extended riff on the women part, right? So yeah, summarize that for yeah. us. Oh, yeah. Um, so back in 2009 for the Cato Institute, uh, Peter Thiel put out a, um, a, it's a pretty good essay. Hang on, I'm going to have to pull up the thing so I know it, it, which what it is. I have my thing. Um, his essay is called The Education of a Libertarian. And in it, he makes, um, he makes kind of this sort of throwaway comment about there's two constituencies that are notoriously tough for libertarians. Um, one is welfare beneficiaries and the other was the extension of the franchise to women. Um, but I thought it was kind of an interesting thing to point out, at least as like, as a libertarian, um, am, I, am I a libertarian? I don't know. I go back and forth. I think if libertarians don't think that women should vote, I'm definitely not a libertarian because I think I definitely should have a right to vote. But, um, uh, yeah, I just thought it was really interesting that he saw women as being antithetical at the base, or at least women starting to vote as being, um, kind of a setback to the libertarian movement. Um, uh, and I, like, so the essay I wrote back in November about it is all like, well, why would he say this? He'd say it because he thinks it's true, right? Um, or because his audience, he's not going to, there's no amount of audience that he's calculated that he's going to off put by saying that, right? Um, yep. So I think that like either... Either he believes it's true, in which case, of course, it's worth stating because you should, you know, why would he, if he thinks it's true or, and, or like, he's decided that women as a, like women who vote aren't a political capital that he'll ever have any like um, amount of like ideology that will appeal to them. Um, so he's automatically like, he's by putting this argument out there, he's looking to diminish the potential power of a group that he has decided will never support his political aims anyway. Um, because hmm. if women are never going to support your project, then if you can get them to stop having a vote, then um, then you, the chances <laughs> of your political project becoming more possible are greater, right? So like, I don't know. Yeah, um, yeah. Though I think it's actually both. It's both sort of a tactical feeding of a constituency he knows he won't convince. Plus, I think he actually literally does believe in it. And uh, I would say, like, based on uh, sort of how you've described your politics um, over various episodes, I I'd say you're a pretty um, 
you're, you're what I would call a libertarian. That term was uh, popular several years ago, like, you know, somewhere between liberal and libertarian. I think so am I. But I think they're both kind of like normie versions of those things. Whereas yeah. Peter Thiel is uh, sort of a weird kind of libertarian because it comes with sort of, I don't know, monarchist uh, Catholic tendencies. And he also believes in creative monopolies. And uh, so there's a bunch of things going on where I think uh, Peter Thiel is libertarian, but not in the sense that you and I might be libertarian or even in the sense that, uh, you know, the Koch brothers might be libertarian. He's, he's his own weird thing. So, okay, yeah. This is like, um, so recently, I don't know how I came across it. There's like this Magic the Gathering, like it has six different colors, right? So there's like um, green, red, blue, black, uh, white, and green, red, blue, black, white, and then something else red I don't know I've already said that one but there's like six colors and so the person or maybe there's only five anyways they like put them in like a circle and kind of use these to describe different like the way the cards and stuff go and um I decided I'm like a oh god I'm gonna have to look it up I can't remember the exact thing I think that Peter Thiel is a white black um libertarian where black is kind of like the more like super edgy libertarian mm -hmm. and then white is um way more kind of like kind of where you would put like catholic church like in terms of um power and uh purity um and so he's got like i think a really strong white black alignment um whereas i think you and me run more red blue red blue okay. flies over the black territory which is where the libertarians hang out but their um, value system is definitely more on like, I think red is like sort of chaos and freedom and action and blue is like knowledge. Um, huh, arts and okay, stuff. that's kind of confusing because uh, oh, maybe. Uh, okay. it, it got me thinking of like uh, red, blue on the US political spectrum, but that's not what you're talking about. You're talking no, about blue as order and red as chaos. So it's more, Okay, I got it. It's a, black, it's a white totally is... different alignment. Sorry, yeah. I'd have, okay. to like, I'd have to like tweet out like the thing. It makes sense as a system in and of itself. And if you're familiar with Magic the Gathering. Um, I'm not actually. I played it once, but I've managed to forget everything about one <laughs> session. Yeah. Yeah. But anyways, I think my point is that like the, I think that we, we end up spending a lot of time in the same sort of circles that libertarians do, but that our value system has a different like kind of polarity to it or like the directionality yeah. of it is slightly different. Though, uh, honestly, I, like since the topic we labeled it theism, I would not even call theism an ideology per se. Mm -hmm. It's sort of a bunch of honestly, like nerd Aspie resentments combined with like a weird personal history of being Catholic and gay and uh, going, growing up in Silicon Valley in a particular, or coming of age in Silicon Valley, being part of the PayPal mafia. So Thiel is, Thielism is really sort of the outcome of a sort of weird smart person taking in a lot of um, fairly weird inputs or not weird, but uh, marginal inputs like nerd culture, all those things sort of go in. Lord of the Rings, nerd culture, resentments of um, non-nerds, all those things fuel into a particular personality type. And that's really, so, uh, because I can't actually find a uh, sort of coherent doctrine behind Thielism. It's a bunch of things that Peter Thiel believes in. That's, uh, and that does not have the coherence I would call an ideology. But yeah, to the extent it's an ism and something to stand for a lot a of vibe. people stand for it right hmm? it has like a vibe a oh, vibe totally. yeah he's so uh, i mean we know several things about him now right like uh, for a long time he was a very secretive guy but then several things sort of started coming out he's been a big patron of the rationalist movement he's been a big patron of the new reactionary movement he's been a patron of both the you know uh, yudkowsky rationalist gang and the Mold bug and RX uh, gang, so Curtis Yarwin. Uh, he's what else has he done? He's supported um, particular people in elections. He had that legal fight with Gawker. So there's like a fairly clear pattern emerging. And even though he himself is not super, he, he's limited in what he says. He says a few very pointedly provocative things, like you know, uh, women are sort of um, bad for libertarianism libertarianism or democracy is bad. He says those few things, but really much of the development of Thielism as an ideology is done by people who are gravitate around him. So mm -hmm. the Thiel capital, people like Eric Weinstein, Weinstein a bunch yeah. of others. 
And so I, I would say, for example, the so-called intellectual dark web is a pretty, pretty much a sort of uh, second order tealist uh, community. So Monastery yeah. Or a night, night, nightly round table. Um. Something like that. So Arthur himself is missing, but it's a nightly round table, all right. But um, yeah, I, I should make my own sort of biases clear. I, I mean, I dislike the guy and I'm annoyed by the pattern of influence he reveals over intellectual culture. And I think tealism is not a bad thing for culture. Like quite apart from several things where I'm not personally impacted, but I'm sort of supportive. Like I don't agree with his views on women and stuff like that, but that's sort of uh, not even coming into my personal, um, impacting me personally. But yeah, in general, I think tealism is bad for the world. That's <laughs> sort of my take on tealism. I think one thing that I find so interesting about it is how incredibly well, I feel like, I think Teal did a good job of making his um, himself like not necessarily available, but um, influential in terms of like the young founder set in Silicon Valley. And the way that he did that was really interesting through like his, um, is it the founders under like yeah, they found, were really- Yeah, he's got a couple, was, Teal Capital Founders Fund is one of them. Yeah, yeah but I think it, is another. Specifically how he went out and found young people that he thought had great business ideas or cool, like young founders and gave them like $50,000 to not go to college. Um, oh yeah, yeah, that uh, teal 20 under 20. So yeah, he's done a bunch of things, but uh, uh, honestly, when I look at the net effect, it's not that different from what many other wealthy people do. Uh, but the I, way he does it, there is sort of a charismatic spin that he puts on it that um, attracts a lot of attention. So that's kind of interesting because um, he's good at um, sort of optics and image management in a way his peer billionaires are not. Oh, so, I think that's really uh, true. Yeah, he's got the, um, and he's also, I mean, I think he's a lot smarter in terms of understanding how uh, propaganda seems a little strong, but ideologies work. Um, and so I think he definitely, I think he does have statement. Like his statements, I think, are, like you, you mentioned how he doesn't have a lot of cohesive statements, but he's got like a few small ones. I feel like he's done a good job of like, with straining, withholding himself just to that small, like. Oh yeah, I mean, that's how that. you build mystique and charisma, right? If you say yeah. too much, you kind of like commoditize yourself and you also become open to like very ordinary kinds of critical scrutiny. If you like write 50 essays or like give speeches all the time, it's like, yeah, you're a normal intellectual and people can criticize you. But if you mm -hmm. only say like a few sort of uh, cryptic, aphoristic things once in a while and let everybody else do the talking, you can kind of benefit from the mystique and charisma. Uh, but I don't know that he's actually consciously good at optics and image building. I think he genuinely has a very mythic sense of himself. So like, you know, he, like Aragon and Lord of the Rings or something like that. He's got that missionary sense of um, who he is. Uh, and you see this, like you know, one of his, I think, investment arms is called Mithril Capital. And I think mm -hmm. that's one of the ones that does... Uh, uh, I don't know, weird out there investments, but Mithril is a reference to a lot of the ring's armor, right? So yeah, he's got like, and Palantir. Palantir is an object from a lot of the rings as well. And he was involved in that. I don't know if he was involved in naming, but yeah, so there's a sort of, it's not sort of uh, myth-making in the sense of like P.T. Barnum or uh, what's his name? Uh, Freud's nephew, Edward Bernays. This is more, he's, he's living a mythic heroic narrative. Yeah, and I think, well, I mean, I don't know, I kind of, I get really tempted to make the, like, um, analogy between Thiel and, like, a certain amount of monkishness, like, the sort of, like, orders that he, he like, builds order, like, monkish orders, right? Like, the intellectual dark web is, like, an order of, like, and the monkishness, I think, uh, the, the reason I would call it, like, monkish is because of the, like, sort of, like, hyper-masculine, almost, like, not sterile, but, like, definitely not, um, like they're not, there's different. There's like a lack of femininity in like all of these spaces. Um, yes, I'm trying to think now. Do I know many women in the teal orbit? And I think I know a couple. But yeah, it's like definitely a bit of a sausage fest. There's like I don't know, ninety percent male or something. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, when you draw the sort of subcultural map of the terrain you do find that, um, you know, next to IDW, you have like Jordan Peterson, you've got the incel crowd, you've got the red pill crowd that we've talked about before. So yeah, it sort of uh, abuts that territory quite a bit culturally. Um, and, okay, we've spent 15 minutes on tealism and it sounds like a topic we'll be circling back to 
the future. So let's put a pin in it and move on to our next one. What do we have Great. next? Yeah, our next thing is tears for trauma. Trauma, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> who put that there, you or me? I thought you put that down, but I might Oh, have. yeah, yeah. I, I, I remember now why, why I put it. Oh, yeah, so there's, um, we talked about post rats a few weeks ago, but there seems to be an interesting offshoot of post rats, especially on Twitter, uh, built around, I don't know, talking about trauma a lot, processing trauma. Uh, and if you follow all the same people, but uh, for example, Tiago wrote a bunch of, uh, a big long essay, Tiago Forte wrote a big long essay on processing like trauma from uh, sort of uh, physical thing he has with his throat. Then you've got, uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name, the Chinese guy, Kichu Yuan, QC, he goes by QC. And yeah. he started this thing he calls the Sob Squad. So basically men learning how to cry and emote and do all that stuff. Then you've got circling. So you've got a bunch of these things going on that are all about like actively processing trauma. And then there's meditation Twitter. That's also a bunch of people working on this stuff. So it's just something I've kind of saw and flagged as a thing that's happening. As like a, a thing. So I'm curious, what was the, like, could you say a little more about this Chiago thing in his throat? That sounds really interesting. Oh, so uh, I think there's this um, thing called uh, vagus nerve therapy Yay. or something, right? So part of it is just kind of like traditional stuff, like uh, some yoga breathing stuff like pranayama. That's basically the same thing. But this is a yeah. modernized, updated version that's a bunch of like therapy related to like your vagus nerve with a bunch of like neuroscience stuff attached to it. Uh, I don't know quite what to make of it, to be honest. Uh, but you were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know something about the vagus nerve? I know nothing about oh, it. Oh, yeah. So, so I it? took singing lessons for oh, okay. four years. And um, triggering your vagus nerve is something that you can do that happens sometimes when you sing. And it's actually um, tends to lead to like really good pitch. Um, but it is a really uh, deep, strange kind of ex like a very physical, weird, deep seated um, experience. Like when I, when you do it correctly, and in fact, when you sing correctly, you, it makes you feel a bit nauseous. You feel it's like nausea, kind of. But it like um, I tend to sing in my shower because I'm very I guess, typical human that way. And um, <laughs> the uh, once I was like I don't know I was taking a shower and I managed to like trigger my vagus nerve and once you trigger it it kind of is like the self-reinforcing feedback cycle that like you can't stop so I was definitely like sort of like leaning over in the shower singing while like this like kind of had this like nauseous experience um it's super great I mean I'm making it sound terrible but um it is like uh it is kind of this like I don't know it's just so deeply embedded in your body and it's like a part of your body that you're not ever like be, having access to that depth of um, sensation is like really, yeah, it kind of does kind of like open you up and put you in a good mood. And um, like, yeah, I think it, it does have a lot of like psychosomatic effects. Um, huh. So going beyond just plain sort of meditative relaxation and relaxation response, you're saying it has like uh, higher level cognitive stuff having to do with like emotional traumas and stuff? I don't, I mean, it might. I mean, so the thing about, there's a real, I mean, there's this great, I can't remember her name. I was going to look it up, but um, there's this great book on kind of exercise and like body work. It's body work. Um, and she talks about how like trauma is like stored in your body. Um, I also like. Oh, the body so many, remembers. Is that the book? Uh, Tiago referenced that a lot. He wrote a big summary of it. The body remembers, I think is the name of the book. It's not the same. I think what oh, okay. he referred to is a, um, well, I think it's definitely a truth. I think this is a global truth that like every human, like your life, I don't know. But um, this book in particular wasn't, it's actually like my voice teacher who put me onto it. She, because this woman, this therapist who wrote the book is located in New York City and she works with a lot of vocalists because so much of getting good vocal production is about breath control. And so she's got a lot of really like centralized breath control exercises that make you get at singing, which is interesting when you think about it, how like a lot of the meditation stuff is also breath focused. So mm -hmm. um, I think that there's like, I think there's an under investigated connection between certain amounts of like singing 
and meditation? I don't know that it's under investigated, but I think it's not sort of explicit because all meditation traditions tend to have music traditions attached to them. Mm. Um, like um, some of them are especially strong, like um, in Sufi traditions, uh, you've probably heard the term whirling dervishes. Yes, I've heard of that. So that's actually a dance and music form that goes with like um, Turkish and Persian sort of um, Sufi mysticism, where it's a particular kind of slow twirling dance going with like very, I don't know, low pitched singing and so forth. So yeah, I think there's a strong connection, but it's wrapped up in traditions. And one of the interesting things I think we're seeing now is people kind of want to go first principles and abandon like a lot of... uh, baggage from traditionalism, I want to say, like, you know, you've got all this sort of uh, Buddhist and yoga and uh, in the West, you've got like, um, I don't know, uh, Christian monastic traditions and more recent things like Alexander Technique and all those things. And people want to kind of like get rid of all that historical baggage and approach this stuff almost first principles. That's why I think they're attracted to like, you know, can we think of it in terms of the vagus nerve? Can we think of it as like just body work or voice work or movement work and they kind of want to like learn it from first principles or something at least that's mm-hmm. the sense i get from the way people talk about it on twitter but, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting uh, because it's like almost a backlash or retreat from our overly sort of symbolic and textual culture especially online i mean we are constantly sharing text and images with each other and even voice, it's like language voice. We're not singing at each other or making noises at each other. And this is almost like people want to have a much more somatic and kind of body awareness based uh, aspect to their life, something like that. Which is hard to get through our current digital mediums. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know. It leaves me a little bit bemused because I think. Uh, yeah, at this point, it's mainly tra- uh, traditional middle-aged back aches and joint aches kind of stuff that's bugging me. So it's like very banal, boring stuff that you kind of just have to do something to get over. But uh, this is like, uh, well, what? okay, that's what fascinates me. This is like young, early 20s people getting into this kind of stuff. And it's almost like uh, there's a there's like an old fuddy-duddy quality to it. It's like, you're 21. How much bodily and psychological trauma could you possibly have? Like I can kind of see people sort of getting into this like late 30s or 40s. It's like you're beaten up. It's like if the body remembers and that's the pr- primary thesis, by 35, 40, you have a bunch of things that's piled up and you need to process. But it's like, no, this is 18 to 21 year olds. <laughs> like an entire blockchain worth of trauma stored up apparently. So I don't know, maybe I'm... Oh, I think that the trauma that they're talking about is mostly like emotional. Um, And I think that, I mean, so to me, I guess I can, it seems like not so puzzling because teenagers are known for being the most emotional side of humanity, right? Like the emotions. Yeah, but being emotional is not the same as being actually traumatized, right? So you feel things strongly, you're angsty about your situation in life, but you've not actually lived long enough to accumulate a lot of trauma, unless it's like, you know, child abuse and things like that. Like, But your perspective on what qualifies as trauma when you're 20 might be slightly different than when you're 40. (laughs) Yeah, I might just be, uh, this might just be my age speaking. I'm like, walk it (laughs) off. Yeah, you are a little bit. <laughs> like, stop feeling right, so that's, deeply, children. Like, <laughs> I think the reason it sort of strikes me that way is, holy shit, if they're like this broken up and deep mm. into sort of working on healing at, based on the traumas they've accumulated by 21, by the time they're like 30, it's going, they're going to kill themselves. It's like, no, because they- it just shit keeps piling up and it gets worse and worse as you age. And it's like, if you can't handle the 21 year old stuff with like a fairly casual attitude, by the time you're 30, by the time you're 40, it's like, you'll be... But I think that the reality of being a young 20 year old is a lot shittier than being like a 30 year old. Like, is it? Like, hmm. Yeah, because the lack of power that you have in the world is like at its lowest. You really have the most, autom- it's like, 
you're kind of like at the low point of like high autonomy in terms of like oh do whatever you want but like really low power to like actually achieve a lot um you don't have very much of like a professional network yet you don't have enough like self-confidence in yourself because you haven't been doing a thing for five to six years yet like uh the world doesn't really care about you and your problem oh, yeah. I, I get all that. I mean, I mean, I was twenty slash twenty five once, and yeah, I went through all those things. You didn't like jump through. I it. skipped from twelve to thirty. Yeah, <laughs> maybe yeah. Sometimes it does feel like that. Like I skipped a lot of stages and kind of just jumped ahead, born old. I think you did go to. You, you were in grad school for a long time. I would assume. Yes, and that part of that was <laughs> traumatic in its own ways. But I, I think I, I might be sort of. Um, navigating by a very narrow definition of trauma. To me, trauma mm-hmm. is distinct from simply life stage angst or just normal routine shit life throws at you, right? Like, uh, uh, so it might be a mix of like, I'm not as sensitive as most people. Plus I have a narrow definition of trauma as unusual shit that happens to you and actually leaves you with scars and wounds that need active work to heal, right? Yeah. So just taking a long walk and being fatigued in your muscles is not trauma. That's just taking a long walk and being tired versus if you're in a car accident and you break a leg, that's trauma, right? And psychologically, or even, it's, yeah, yeah, or not wanting to get in a car ever again, right? Or like, there you go. My, my voice instructor actually got into a car wreck that basically destroyed her singing career as far as I understand it because it messed up her throat and then <laughs> she just like, yeah, um, that's trauma, right? That's like, yeah. And same thing with psychological stuff, right? I mean, ordinary breakups or a bad date or your mom yelling at you, it's like part of life. Whereas um, a a trauma might be something like uh, being mugged and beaten up and tossed in an alley. You know, know, there's a spectrum there, of course, and sensitivity determines how you sort of react even Mm -hmm sort of ordinary routine stuff. But, but I think uh, that economic precarity is also traumatic. Oh yeah. Like, yes. Which I think, like, probably I could see that affecting younger humans more so than people in their, like, 30s and 40s. Yes, especially people who are young now as opposed to when I was young in the 90s when the economy was kind of booming. Yeah. yeah. I think that gets at a chronic versus acute stressor mm-hmm. aspect of trauma. And yeah. chronic really does do a number on you. All right. Yeah. So how much time did we spend on this? I'm doing timekeeping today. So it's, uh, we have 27 minutes left. I think we could do two more topics. Let's do two more topics. So we've got, do you want to, are you looking at the list or should I just go with the next oh, one? Yeah, just read them off. I'm, I don't have the document open. Okay. I don't understand this one. Two cultures. Oh, two cultures. Let's uh, table that one. That's a bigger topic. It's, it, there's a, uh, famous book by what's his name cp snow called the two cultures about the divide between uh, humanities and uh, stem subjects so it's basically sort of a classic commentary on academia and like scholarly culture from the 60s so it's a famous argument but it needs updating and um, a full session so let's oh, skip okay. that one great yeah. we'll come back to it uh next up is tv tv yes a lighter topic let's talk tv okay great let's talk tv um what do you like about TV? Our, our show is called Scorpio Season TV. Um, uh-huh, yeah. The full name. Um, so we're kind of doing TV here. What do you like about television, Venkat? I think it's the greatest invention in history. I mean, like I would want to kill myself right now in the pandemic if it wasn't for TV. Mm. Right? It's like um, people, if people sort of underestimate just how huge TV has been since it was invented. Like um, we spend, uh, even people who kind of like turn up their noses at TV and are snobbish about it. Um, and maybe they go to like, you know, French cinema and like little indie theaters or something. I, I'm kind of hmm. enjoying a little bit of uh, uh, Schadenfreude at their expense right now, because now if you want to watch anything, it has to be on like a computer or a TV size screen. You can't go to the theater. So that that's amusing me right now. But yeah, I, I have a broad definition of TV. It includes streaming, most of YouTube, but not all. Because YouTube, I think, gets you into slightly a different medium where you have to like go through click trails and like it, it's slightly different. But TV, I think, uh, streaming, regular TV and so forth. So yeah, uh, what are you watching lately? What have you been watching? I haven't been what watching been anything. 
When was the last time you watched TV? I don't know. I like, I'd have to go back and look at my Netflix. I honestly can't tell you the last episode. Like, okay, but my, my memory is also real shit. So it might've been like, I haven't watched anything during the pandemic. So at least January. Wow. wow. Uh, but uh, what are your general attitudes towards TV? You like it? Don't like it? Indifferent? Watch a lot? Watch I, a little? Like, I mean, I, I've usually had like TV shows I'm watching. Like I usually have like a show that's like my thing. And when I went to Brazil, I got way into telenovelas there. Like they were the greatest <laughs> thing ever. Um, so like I really love shows. I just lately I've been having a lot of trouble finding things that keep my interest and it's not just mm-hmm. tv like um i did watch a movie lately which was amazing which okay to be fair it's only rated as like the best movie ever um so it was i mean it was pretty great i was seven samurai just... oh yeah i've watched that have you seen it yeah i've seen it okay i like yeah anyways it's like yeah and it legitimately is like best movie ever it's like oh yeah this is actually like the best movie ever that's like that's legit it's cool um I went into it a little skeptical and then came out the other end of it three hours later, like, oh yeah, that was great. Um, but like, okay. Wait, are, are you talking about the Kurosawa version? Yeah. Okay, the Japanese one. Okay, because there yeah. have been two American versions, right? Oh, I didn't know there's that. A, oh, oh yeah, they did the remake Magnific- the uh, The Magnificent Seven or something, I think it's called. I don't know. I forget what the American name is. But yeah, and there was a more recent one with uh, Denzel Washington and the older one is uh, 1960s, a bunch of white guys. I don't know what it is. Uh, but yeah, it has been remade twice. It's also, I think, been remade in other languages. So yeah, it's um, it's pretty good. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's incredible. It was an incredible yeah. movie. Um, it was like black and white. Anyways, so I so I've watched movies. Those are easier to get into because they're a little less time. But no, I haven't really been watching. I don't uh, even know what is good anymore. Like I feel like my something about my ability to like appreciate and watch television without getting overly critical or like overly obsessed with like minor details that annoy me is like exponentially dropped up a cliff if that makes sense okay like, so i think i'm i see we, what the difference is between i guess people like you and in general people who focus on like quality movies as opposed to people like me who are actually tv centric like classic core tv long form programming that runs over weeks and weeks of like episodes and i think the difference is we aren't actually looking for a quality art to give our undivided attention to it's more like ambient ongoing world building so actually if it's Mm. too good i don't like it like this whole idea of like golden age of tv hbo shows sopranos all that like really high production values kind of tv yeah i don't enjoy it that much what i like is middle brow kind of budget shows that are kind of like competently written, sort of respect the craft well, but fundamentally have sort of a lighthearted, uh, low expectations, sort of elevator music sensibility to them. And I think my favorite sort of collection of shows uh, that sort of fit the description is, uh, uh, what, what did they call it? Blue Sky Television. So Blue Sky Television was this generic name USA Network came up with for a bunch of shows that included Monk, Psych, White Collar, mm-hmm. um, Royal Pains. So a bunch of like really lighthearted, uh, fairly sort of uh, optimistic, not sort of like dark emotional tones. But so these are like shows that are very easy to watch. So it's like eating chips or something. You can sort of uh, half pay attention to them while they're going on. They're extremely rewatchable because there's not much Mm -hmm. going on. It's not like emotionally intense or like, you know, there's not like big secrets being revealed and it's spoiled or something so you can mm-hmm. sort of watch the whole show then go back and watch it all over again so like some shows like psych i watched like three or four times all the way through so huh. okay. that to me is the essence of tv and i think it's fundamentally a new invention like movies are old movies go back to like 1910s or something and movies have evolved as a separate sort of craft but television of the sort we are talking about uh, binge-worthy sort of light ambient world building in the background that's yeah. I think fairly new like um, I, I would say uh, I would date it to the original Star Trek series because that's okay. like you know middle brow average production quality storytelling not very surprising or intense or like intellectually demanding it's like you don't have to be very you know artistically sophisticated to enjoy this stuff so that mm. stuff I think started in the 60s and 70s 
and it's become a huge part of like social technology. I mean, it's how societies sort of keep themselves entertained and short of killing each other in civil wars. It's a big, big technology. I, yeah, I think you're right. You know, I'm thinking about it. I like, it's like thinking about, I don't know, like, have you, have you heard of like the marvelous Mrs. Maisel? Yes, I love that show. It was a little a too show. rich for me. Like, it, it, it was a little too much towards golden age of uh, high quality TV. But yeah, mm-hmm. it was good. Okay. It I was really good. liked it. It was one of my favorite shows. But like, anyways, like, I, thinking about it, I was like, I think I would watch more television if I had a fast forward button. Um, because I think the problem with most television is they go too slow for me. And I want more content quickly. So... I was watching Stargate for a while in college and I figured out that I could fast forward through sections and like all of a sudden it became a lot more like watchable. I don't know. <laughs> so this is, uh, again, I think um, a mix of taste and what your expectations is. Like movies are a lot more intense. Like even like a very slow moving movie, it packs a lot more into those couple of hours. Uh, and TV, you kind of have to like, you either have to speed it up, like you're saying, kind of like 4X podcast listening, which I imagine some people do with our show, or you, or you listen, or when you, re, when you edit, you listen at 2X speed. I haven't figured out how to do it on the editor, though. If I could, I definitely would, because it would speed up the job. But usually I go back and listen to it after I've posted it, and I do it at 2X. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I've never been able to get into that. Uh, I only mm-hmm. listen at normal speed, but my attention level varies. Like shows that I've watched through a couple of times already, and I kind of almost know the plot by heart. Like Futurama is one. I've watched it like six times all the way through now, and I know all the plots. I kind of know half the dialogue, but there's always like little bits I missed in the last watch through. Mm-hmm. So sometimes I pick up on it. But now that I know it so well, it's almost like background music. It's like listening to f- favorite music rather than... Um, you know, fictional narrative. And so I can be on Twitter, I can be reading something and Futurama is going on in the background. And it's like almost rehearsing a world that I'm sort of literate in and I know how to inhabit uh, sort of huh. pleasantly. So that, that's kind of how I view TV. It's, it's sort of cognitive furniture almost. Do you listen to a lot of like music and stuff in the background or like just TV? No. Shows? So this is one of the weird things uh, about me at some point I basically lost all interest in music so for a long time I was very into music I had a big music collection I would listen a lot I would listen while I was uh, working or studying I would listen trying to go to sleep or taking a walk Uh, but at some point it kind of like just stopped mattering to me so music I I can still listen I mean uh, if it's playing I'll listen sometimes if it's a long road trip I'll play a couple of songs but in general I don't need music in my life anymore and it mostly annoys me i prefer silence to uh, music uh but yeah tv is a kind of music that i'm still into yeah because i'm like i feel like you hearing you describe music is kind of how i feel about tv shows which is just interesting um i mean it's one of those like i'd love to find the tv show that pulls me in and that i want to spend hours with but i just don't think that's gonna happen these days yeah it's oh that's not Another interesting difference, like there's people who are always constantly on the lookout for new shows because they don't like watching reruns too much. Like so there's a spectrum. There's people who only watch a show once ever with like full attention and people who like the more, anytime they find a good show, they'll sort of go into their sort of collection and be endlessly rewatched. And there's people in between. So my wife, for example, uh, she likes to find and watch new shows a lot more than I do. Whereas mm, I- with me, it's like, yeah, if I don't find a new show, I'm fine. I'll just rewatch some of my old stuff. Wow, that's incredible. Uh, huh. Yeah. Uh. And it's, I, I think you once described, um, uh, we were talking about cartoons, I think, and I think you pointed out that my taste in fiction is also kind of cartoonish. So I think yeah. all of this is like low fidelity cartoon sensibilities. I like a cartoon world around me. <laughs> mm. Interesting. All right. We have 15 minutes left. Great. We can Let's do talk about... I have tarot next up, but I don't know if I can talk about tarot. All right, you pick the next topic. Uh, let's talk about taxes. Taxes, okay. Delusion Which taxes. is like sort of topical because the tax date just ended last week. So, oh, this is our first episode after the tax, new tax deadline. Ooh, yeah, yeah. In the this is our new tax year episode. Uh, sort of. Do you do your own taxes? I used to. 
Um, I did my own taxes for a very, very long time. And then just last year when I got into Bitcoin stuff, decided that I was going to not do taxes by myself anymore. So I now have a firm (laughs) somewhere up in Connecticut or Maryland that does my taxes. And I asked a friend in New York for a recommendation. They gave me their local one and yep, they do all my taxes now. It's great. Except for the whole part about where you have to do all the bookkeeping. Bookkeeping and taxes, not the same thing. Yes. Uh, I have both a bookkeeper and a CPA and have had them both for almost 10 years at this point. Before that, I had another Mm -hmm. CPA and he was not that good. But yeah, uh, Mm -hmm. both of them, it's like a huge relief to have them. But it's kind of interesting what you mentioned about Bitcoin because over the last 10 years, I've been pretty much completely outsourced in terms of taxes to my CPA. But Mm -hmm. once uh, crypto became a thing and the first year I had to like report like uh, crypto sales, it was mm-hmm. messy enough and new enough that that's the one part I do myself. Like oh. I have a spreadsheet where I just uh, track like um, crypto trades and it's easier to just do that and then report them to my CPA as like long-term and short-term capital gains um, because um, yeah, the software simply isn't there. Like there's a couple of people trying to make good crypto software, but it's crap. But, um, yeah. yeah, I actually... No, I actually spent most of my time this year on taxes was doing all the bookkeeping for all of my crypto stuff. It was a pain in the butt. God, it was horrible. Like the first year I had to do that, 2017, that, mm-hmm. that was the big boom year and everybody was like super excited and we were all, I think, trading far too much without an eye to how much of a headache it would be at tax time. It's like, and it wasn't even like high value trade. Some of it was like the crappy altcoins that we were trading just for yep. fun. And yep. hey, each of them becomes like three or four rows in your spreadsheet. That is annoying yep. as hell. Uh, yep. Yep. Yeah. I, yep. I have all my, like, so this year was bad because I had to set up all of my spreadsheets. I didn't have the spreadsheets. Now I have the spreadsheets and I know how to put data in them. And I wrote some code that will calculate my basis for all of my stuff. So like it does the whole thing. And then I found some more software that would like print out rows into like whatever the tax form pdf is so i like <laughs> like generated 15 pdfs and sent them to my accountants and was like here it is okay you you've done a better job than me i have a spreadsheet but mainly it's just manual formulas and stuff and um the hardest part which i haven't yet figured out how to automate enough is uh, uh a single asset that you have in different lots like if you have like you know uh, for Bitcoin and you bought 1.5 at one point and then 0.75 at another point. So that's your thing. And you're sort of also selling it. And then you have to kind of keep track of which one you're drawing down and move oh, on yeah. to the next one. That was horrible. But I have a spreadsheet, spreadsheet set up that does, does it. That. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. My spreadsheet does that. And actually I have a yeah. formula. I have a button I'm pushing. It goes and it does. So if you change anything, it'll go and recalculate it all. Okay, you've done a much better job than me because I have like a, I would say 75% automated spreadsheet, but I still have to like track these sort of nonlinear boundaries. It's like, okay, now I sold like half a Bitcoin, but 0.3 comes from this previous lot and 0.2 comes oh, no, from this yeah, next yeah, No, lot. it figures that all out for me. Oh yeah, that and I have I to do manually do still. I can either do it live or FIFO. Yeah, but that's the painful part then, Kat. Yeah. Because I have like a little toggle. It's just like, I mean, I, for each asset, I pick a method of doing it. LIFO is last in, first out. FIFO is yeah. first in, first yeah. out. Um, and so, like, you pick it and you stick with it. Um, FIFO is the one that's guaranteed not to ever be a problem. LIFO might, at some point, they might question yeah. your usage of it. At this point, I've, like, um, I manage my trading with an eye on taxes, as in, like, I try to minimize the headaches it'll cause and keep it limited to the number of trades I do. But anyway, it's a... It's no longer like 2017 was a lot of like crazy fun, but now it's kind of like boring. It's just like maintaining um, a stock portfolio or something. So it's, mm-hmm. you kind of just keep an eye on it and it takes like an yeah. hour every year to catch up. So yeah, not a big deal. Uh, uh, what else so. on taxes? I was, well, was going to say, oh, so my tax, my taxes are sort of complicated though, because, and part of it is that, and the reason I had to write like that thing to do all the like whatever is because I have crypto miners in my garage and so doing adding that accounting oh, yeah. means yeah there's a lot it's hey, there's like hundreds of transactions oh and now you're also a homeowner right so you're gonna have to do oh, yeah. homeowner taxes next year you bought that this year last no. year which is why That's I got right. an accountant is because they did all that like you know like so when I started doing my taxes I like 
I did my, <laughs> I did my taxes. Is it, has it been a decade? It's been a decade. They can't come after me this for it anymore. So it's like under right seven years is the the longitude that someone can come back and you can get audited. Um, so we're past that now. Okay. So when I went to when I first went to college, um, <laughs> like the uh, what do you call it? Um, still like worry about how much I should say about this. I like um no seven years. We're past seven years. Statute of limitations has run out. Okay. Like the um. <laughs> When I first went, so I was 18, I got a lot of scholarships for going to college. Um, and so I had to start doing taxes at like 18, whatever. It was all like money that I had, you know, it's like how much money you made and whatever. Um, and uh, after a while, anyway, so like every new year, I'd like add on new stuff. I had to figure out how to do taxes for. So like, you know, you start with one thing and you add on like other little bits and pieces and doing a schedule C and all these other little things. And then it got really complicated when I, what did I do? It was like super complicated and I regretted. Um, oh, then I started like buying things on like Schwab, like on like Schwab, I like the stock trading. Thing. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, so then you learn how to kind of do dividends and whatever. And then at some point I bought something that was like a limited partnership that trades like a stock, but you didn't know it was a limited partnership. And I got a K one trying to figure out the taxes for me for that broke me. That was what I got an accountant <laughs> for. I was like, I don't know what the hell they are talking about here. Like, what are these numbers? Why is my cost basis going down now after having to do all the Bitcoin stuff? I know exactly what they were doing and I could probably figure it out and I needed a spreadsheet and I was going to have to track it in a thing and it all would have been fine until I sold it. But I didn't know that at the time. I was just like, K-1s, I have never looked at this part of the tax code before and holy crap, is it confusing. <laughs> um, yeah, but now I'm an accountant. Uh, I think I do all my stock trading in my retirement account. So that sort of um, takes all that down the street. I do have like a regular trading account, but I basically only once did one trade with it and it's, I've been holding it long. So basically it's not a thing. Um, yeah. I wish Robin Hood had, if Robin Hood had retirement account stuff, that would be great. I don't know. All these like stock trading things. When I worked at, I worked at Square Cash, like the Cash App team for a while. Mm -hmm. And it, when they were adding the, um, I was there when they were making the decision to add investing, like as a part of their platform, like basically competing with Robin Hood. And my whole thing was like, guys, like, okay, if we really want to do like a cool new interesting thing with stock investing, like make it possible for you to hold your money in like a four way 1k account. And that like nicely fits in with like the cash apps, like um, their stated mission of being like uh, a good place for underserved like people with like mm -hmm. bank, whatever things. Um, I think that that was probably a lot more regulatory and complications than just launching like a brokerage accounts. But um I still think that that is an untapped opportunity for some like digital trading. Um, yeah, it's, you're right about these things. Like it's like straws getting added to the camel's back and then one thing finally breaks you. And for you, it was, I guess this um, schedule K kind of stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. For me, it was just starting my own business. And um, the first year I did my own bookkeeping. This was, I think, 2010 or 2011. Second year, yeah, first two, three years, I did my own bookkeeping. And then at some point it was such a mess. And when I finally got a bookkeeper and like a CPA who knew what he was doing, he looked at what I had been doing for the previous couple of years. And I was like, this is a disaster. You should stop doing this. Um, but anyway, yeah, since then it's been, a part of it is, yeah, it's like so easy to kind of like half-ass it and do it amateurishly and just get on with your life that you kind of don't recognize the benefits of doing it systematically until you pay somebody to do it uh, for you but yeah there's in general I hate taxes yeah I think I'm very typical like there's some people who actually enjoy it like they enjoy working through the intricacies and figuring out how to like minimize their taxes I'm like is this yeah. really a good use of a life <laughs> no it's not mm, I, yeah I think the payback isn't as high as those people tend to think it might be I think it's a kind of nerd fandom or something like there's people who are fans of comic books and video games and movies. There's people who are fans of the tax code. Like that's literally how it seems to me sometimes. It's like, really, you enjoy figuring out this intricate magic, the gathering type system for no good reason. <sighs> I mean, um, they, maybe it points back for it. So they're into it, you know, like there's like 
points to be gained through this like system it's like very it's like very gamified right like you can figure out <laughs> yeah. the points it's, point, it's like you have the points written into it i guess i don't know and it's i think especially true of the us the us has a very it, it has probably has the most complicated and messy sort of tax system around like when i compare really? to all, yeah like and i think part of it is of course um, as everything regulatory capture so intuit and uh, quickbooks and all the other sort of tax software people they do enough lobbying to make sure the tax code stays complex enough that you need software and uh, professional help to do it for most people uh, beyond a certain level of complexity so that's one reason the us is more complex than it needs to be but the other reason i think is that americans have this sort of DIY garage uh, sort of nerd attitude to oh this is a cool thing that can be gamified and made unnecessarily complicated and i can be a fan of it and like become a tax nerd it's like that that's a very american thing i think it's uh, they actually enjoy the gamified aspect so it's not like the so people like to yell and scream at into it and other lobbying firms that uh, sort of keep it complex but i think deep down americans want to keep it complex because that way then i think americans believe that if a thing is complicated enough and you're smart enough to figure your way through it you came out on top and everybody else is like a mug who's getting taken for a ride but haha you came out on top so they, they like systems to be complicated so they can get the satisfaction of beating the system something like right. that is going on so every american in some ways can feel superior for having beat the same system that they've all had to fight their way through <laughs> something like that i i buy that i think like, it's like our own propaganda it's like self propaganda right it's like we all prove to ourselves that we're brilliant therefore we yep. should keep this difficult system that allows us to run the gauntlet and like come out with the certificate of achievement at the end like i don't know yeah something like that is going on all right all right we have 3 minutes left on the timer so what else uh we have texas also on the thing all right give us a 3 minute rundown of what texas is holy cow i don't know if i can do that in 3 minutes i have to say i spent this weekend in suburbia just maybe it's like a quick little thing i spent this weekend in suburbia helping my dad with a small business and um man it felt like an experience i ended up in like this like yeah i don't know yeah texas is crazy especially i mean i i'm very fond of houston um i was, i mean I hung out with like another family member this weekend also down in the suburbs who was made the comment that houston's like living in the country and a city cuz he was talking about how he could drive down a road and see all the big skyscrapers of downtown but he was on like a two lane little road with little ditches on the side of it next to like a working horse farm um <laughs> And he's like, yeah, that's Houston. It's like working. It's a working city. It's like country city. Um, yeah, ah, that's yeah. That I think that's true of a lot of the south and southeast. A lot of it does have that vibe of city plus country. Uh, though, I think one good test of that in the pandemic is whether there's ongoing conflict between blue mayors and red governors. Like, uh, I think that's going on in Georgia and Florida, where. And Texas. Houston or thing. Texas too is the Houston is there conflict between the Houston mayor and the governor? Oh yeah, because <laughs> our county judge well so it's the county judge is like the person in charge it's not the mayor. We have a mayor but we also have a county judge and the county judge is the one who makes all the rules okay. sort of something like that. Um anyway, yeah, she it's a woman and she's young and cute and in her like late 20s her name's Lena Hildago. She's like Hispanic. Um as far as I can tell she's great. The powers of beast slash men who also have like some amount of jurisdictional like question mark in her same jurisdiction have spent a lot of the earlier part of this year attempting to countermand whatever she said we had to do which was kind of funny like the governor and then there was like another county judge somewhere who might possibly have had the ability and so he's like no no that doesn't stand and she's like no i'm pretty sure that that is like rule you have to wear masks now um anyways like, this is Uh, I shouldn't laugh about it but this is like such a cartoonish Neil Stephensonian sort of cyberpunk future thing that's happening like you know city state type uh, oh, yeah. uh polities getting into conflict with like old dying nationalist empire type things it's like out of a bad science or bad or good science fiction novel depending on how it plays out but that's basically where we are at we should we should find a way to talk about it in the next few letters but, yeah uh, we should yeah Great. Well, thank God. It's always a pleasure. Thanks for uh, coming on Scorpio season. 
for having me and thanks for coming on yourself. All right. So I'll see you next week. Sounds like a plan. Bye. Scorpio season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.